Good evening, Larson Heights, and welcome to Bedtime Stories with Mrs. Schatzko. We are going to continue on with Where the Red Fern Grows, Chapter 15, but I just wanted to do a quick reminder. I would really like to see every single person that is well at school tomorrow so that we can get started on all of our new learning that's going to happen while we do some distance learning. So I can't wait to see you, and I have a new promise to you all that every day that we are not in school, I will continue to post bedtime stories, both a chapter book and a picture book every day. So hope all is well, and let's keep going with Where the Red Fern Grows. Chapter 15. Over a dim, rocky road in a northeasterly direction, our buggy moved on. I noticed that the road stayed at the edge of the foothills, but always in sight of the river. About the middle of the afternoon, we stopped at a small stream to water the team. Papa asked Grandpa if he intended to go all the way to the campground before stopping. No, he said. I figure to put up for the night when we reach Bluebird Creek. With a good early start in the morning, we can make the campgrounds in plenty of time to pitch our tent and set up camp. Late that evening, we reached Bluebird Creek. We didn't set up our tent. With a tarp, we made a lean-to and built a large fire out in front of it. While Grandpa fed and watered the team, Papa and I carried our bedding to the shelter and made down our beds. Grandpa said, while we're cooking dinner, go see your dogs, feed them and fix them a warm bed. I figured to cook them some cornmeal mush, I said, that's what they're used to eating. Mush, Grandpa growled. They're not gonna have mush, not if I can help it. He walked over to a grocery box, mumbling as he did, mush, a hound can't hunt on a belly full of that stuff. He came back and handed me two large cans of corned beef hash and said, here, reckon they'll eat this. I wanted to hug my grandpa's neck. Sure, Grandpa, I said, they'll love that. Opening one of the cans, I dumped it out on a piece of bark in front of old Dan. He sniffed at it and refused to eat. I laughed, for I knew why. While I was opening the other can, Grandpa came over. What's the matter, he asked. Won't he eat it? Sure, Grandpa, I said, he'll eat, but not before little Ann gets her share. With the second can opened, I fed her on another piece of bark. Both of them started eating at the same time. With an astonished look on his face, Grandpa explained, Well, I'll be darned. I never saw anything like that. Why, I never saw a hound that wouldn't eat. Did you train them to do that? No, Grandpa, I said. They've always been that way. They won't take anything away from the other, and everything they do, they do it as one. Papa had overheard our conversation. He said, You think that's strange. You should have seen what I saw the other day. One of the girls threw two cold biscuits out in the backyard to old Dan. He stood and looked at them for a bit, then picking both of them up in his mouth, he trotted around the house. I followed just to see what he was going to do. He walked up in front of the doghouse, laid them down, and growled. Not like he was mad, it was a strange kind of growl. Little Anne came out of the doghouse, and each of them ate a biscuit. Now I saw this with my own eyes. Believe me, those dogs are close to each other, real close. After Papa had stopped talking, silence settled over the camp. Grandpa stood staring at my dogs. In a slow voice, as if he were picking his words, he said, You know, I've always felt like there was something strange about those dogs. I don't know just what it is, and I can't exactly put my finger on it, yet I can feel it. Maybe it's just my imagination. I don't rightly know. Turning to my father, he said, Did you ever notice the way they watch this boy? They see every move he makes. Papa said, Yep. I've noticed a lot of things they've done. In fact, I could tell you a few that you would never believe. But right now, there's something you better believe. Supper is ready. While I was helping myself to hot Dutch oven cornbread, fried potatoes, and fresh side meat, Grandpa poured the coffee. Instead of the two cups I expected to see, he set out three and filled them to the brim with the strong black liquid. I had never been allowed to drink coffee at home and didn't exactly know what to do. I glanced at Papa. He seemed too busy with his eating to pay any attention to me. Taking the bull by the horns, I reached over and ran my finger through the cup's handle. I held my breath as I walked over and sat down by a post oak stump. Nothing was said. Grandpa and Papa paid no attention to what I did. My head swelled up as big as a number four wash tub. I thought, I'm not only big enough to help Papa with the farm, now I'm big enough to drink coffee. 
With supper over and the dishes washed, Grandpa said, Well, we'd better turn in as I want to get an early start in the morning. Long after Papa and Grandpa had fallen asleep, I lay thinking of the big hunt. My thoughts were interrupted when the wonders of night began to stir in the silence around us. From a ridge on our right, a red fox started barking. He was curious and, in his small way, challenging the intruders that had dared to step in his wild domain. From far back in the flinty hills, the monotonous call of a hoot owl floated down in the silent night. It was the mating call and was answered from a distant mountain. I could hear the stamping feet of our horses and the grinding, crunching noise made by their strong teeth as they er ate the hard yellow kernels of corn in their feed boxes. A night hawk screamed as he winged his way through the starlit night. An eerie screech from a tree close by made shivers run up and down my spine. It was a screech owl. I didn't like to hear the small owl, for there was a superstition in the mountains concerning them. It was said that if you heard one owl, it meant nothing at all, but if you heard more than one, it meant bad luck. I lay and listened to the eerie twittering sound. It was coming from the left of our camp. The creepy noise stopped, and for several moments there was silence. When I next heard the cry, it was coming from the right. I sat up in alarm. Had I heard two owls? My movement had awakened Grandpa. In a sleepy voice, he asked, What's the matter? Can't you sleep? What are you sitting up like that for? Grandpa, I heard two screech owls, I said. Grunting and mumbling, he sat up. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, he said, You heard two screech owls? Why, that's nothing. I've heard two. Oh, I see. You're thinking of that bad luck superstition. There's nothing to that, nothing at all. Now you lay down and go to sleep. Tomorrow is going to be a big day. I tried hard to fall asleep, but couldn't. I couldn't get the owls out of my mind. Had I really heard two? Were we going to have bad luck? Surely nothing bad could happen, not on such a wonderful hunt. I found peace in my mind, telling myself that the owl had changed trees. Yes, that was it. He had simply flown out of one tree and into another. The next morning, while having breakfast, Grandpa started kidding me about the screech owls. I wish you could have caught one of those owls last night, he said. We could have boiled him in our coffee pot. I've heard there is nothing like strong hoot owl coffee. It wasn't a hoot owl, Grandpa, I said. It was a screech owl. I don't know for sure if I heard one or two. It could have just been the one. Pointing to a small red oak, I said, I think the first time I heard him, he was over there. And the next time, it was over in that direction. Maybe he changed trees. I sure hope so. Grandpa saw I was bothered. You don't believe that hogwash superstition, do you? Bad luck? Bah, there is nothing to it. Papa laughed and said, These mountains are full of that jinx stuff. If a man believed it all, he'd go crazy. The encouraging words from Papa and Grandpa helped some, but there was still some doubt. It's hard for a young boy to completely forget things like that. Breakfast over and our gear stowed back in the buggy, we left Bluebird Creek. On that day, Grandpa drove a little faster than he had on the previous one, and I was glad of this, for I was anxious to reach the campground. About noon, he stopped the team. I heard him ask Papa, is this Black Fox Hollow? Nope, said Papa. This is Waterfall. Black Fox is the next one over. Why? Well, Grandpa, Grandpa said, there's supposed to be a white flag in the mouth of Black Fox. That's where we leave the road. The camp is in the river bottoms. By this time, I was so excited, I stood up in the buggy box so I could get a better view. Maybe you ought to step them up a little, Grandpa, I said. It's getting pretty late. Papa joined in with his loud laughter. You just take it easy, he said. We'll get there in plenty of time. Besides, these mares can't fly. I saw the flag first. There it is, Grandpa, I shouted. Where, he asked. Over there, see, tied on that grapevine. As we left the main road, I heard Papa say, Boy, look at all those tracks. Sure has been a lot of traveling on this road. That smoke over there must be coming from the camp, Grandpa said. When we came inside of the camp, I couldn't believe what I saw. I stared in amazement. I had never seen so many people at one gathering. Tents were spread out over an acre and a half of ground, all colors, shapes, and sizes. There were odd-looking cars, buggies, wagons, and saddle horses. I heard Grandpa say almost in a whisper, I knew there would be a lot of people, but... I never expected so many. I saw the astonished look on my father's face. Off to one side of the camp, under a large black gum tree, we set up our tent. I tied my dogs to the buggy and fixed a nice bed for them under it, and after everything was taken care of, I asked if I could look around the camp. Sure, Grandpa said, go any place you want to go. 
only don't get in anyone's way. I started walking through the large camp. Everyone was friendly. Once I heard a voice say, that's the boy who owns the two little red hounds. I've heard they're pretty good. If my head had gotten any bigger, I know it would have burst. I walked on as straight as a cane break cane. I looked at the hounds. They were tied in pairs here and there. I had seen many coon hounds, but none that could equal these. There were red bones, blue ticks, walkers, and bloodhounds. I marveled at their beauty. All were spotlessly clean with slick, glossy coats. I saw the beautiful leather leashes and brass studded collars. I thought of my dogs. They were tied with small cotton ropes and had collars made from old check line leather. As I passed from one set of dogs to another, I couldn't help but wonder if I had a chance to win. I knew that in the veins of these hounds flowed the purest of breeded blood. No finer coon hounds could be found anywhere. They came from the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, the Bayou Country of Louisiana, the Red River Bottoms of Texas, and the Flinty Hills of the Ozarks. Walking back through the camp, I could feel the cold fingers of doubt squeezing my heart. One look at my dogs drove all that away. In the eyes of little Anne, it seemed I could read this message. Don't worry, just wait, we'll show them. That night, Grandpa said, tomorrow they'll have a contest for the best looking hounds. Which one are you gonna enter? I told him I didn't think I'd enter either one of my dogs. They were so little, I didn't think they had a chance. Grandpa got all huffed up. He said, it doesn't make any difference how little they are. They're coon hounds, aren't they? I asked him if he'd seen any of the other hounds. He said, yes, I've seen them all. Sure, they're big and good dogs too, but it makes no difference. I don't care if your dogs are no bigger than a snuff can. You still have a chance. Now, which one are you going to enter? I couldn't decide, I said. I'll think it over tonight and let you know tomorrow. The next morning, when I stepped outside the tent, I saw men everywhere. They were combing and brushing their dogs and getting them pruned up for the beauty contest. Beautiful combs and brushes were used to brush expensive oils into their glossy hair. Going over to my dogs, I stood and looked at them. I started to untie old Dan, but taking a closer look at him, I could see he could never win a beauty contest. His face and ears were a mass of old scars caused from the many fights with the tough old goons and bobcats. I held his head in my hand and felt sorry for him, but loved him that much more. I looked over at little Anne and couldn't see any scars. I laughed because I knew why. She was too smart to walk right up in the face of a fight. She would wait till old Dan took hold and then dart in. I untied a rope and walked her over to our tent. My father and grandfather were gone. No doubt they were over in some tent visiting old friends and making new ones. Looking around to find something I could use to groom my dog, I saw grandpa's open suitcase. There, right on top, was the very thing I needed. His beautiful bone-handled hairbrush and his ivory comb. Picking them up, I turned them over and over in my hand. Little Anne stood looking at me. Impulsively, I reached down and raked from her shoulder to hip with the brush. She seemed to like it. I knew I shouldn't do it, but I decided to use them. Knowing I had no oils, I got some butter from our grocery box. With the homemade butter and Grandpa's hair set, I brushed her until she shone. All the time I was grooming her, she tried to lick the butter from my hands. I can't even imagine what Grandpa's brush and comb looked like after that whole thing was completed. The job completed, I stepped back and inspected her. I was surprised at the change. Her short red hair glistened and everyone was in perfect place. Shaking my finger at her, I said, if you lay down and roll, I'll wear you out. Although I knew I wouldn't. Hearing a lot of movement outside, I looked out. Men were setting their dogs on a long table which had been built in the center of the campground. Leading little Anne to it, I picked her up and set her on the table too. I told her to act like a lady. She wagged her tail as though she understood. I untied the rope and stepped back. After the dogs were all lined up, the judging started. Four judges walked around and around the table looking at them from all angles. When one of them would point at a hound, he was taken down and eliminated from the contest. Dog after dog was disqualified. Little Anne was still on the table. My eyes were wide, my throat dry, and my heart thumping. One judge stopped in front of Little Anne. My heart stopped too. Reaching over, he patted her on the head. Turning to me, he asked, is this your dog? I couldn't speak, I just nodded my head. He said, she's a beautiful hound. He walked on down the line. My heart started beating again. There were eight dogs left. Little Anne was still holding her own. Then there were four. I was ready to cry. Two more were taken down. 
Little Anne and a big walker hound owned by Mr. Kyle were the only ones left. The judges couldn't seem to make up their mind. Everyone started shouting, walk them, walk them. I didn't know what they meant. Mr. Kyle and I were told to go to one end of the table. Our dogs were placed at the other end. Mr. Kyle snapped his finger and called his dog. The big hound started walking towards his master. What a beautiful sight it was. He walked like a king. His body was stiff and straight, his head high in the air, his large muscles quivered and jerked under his glossy coat, but something went wrong. Just before he reached the end, he broke his stride, turned, and jumped down from the table. A low murmur ran through the crowd. It was my turn. Three times I tried to call little Anne. Words just wouldn't come out. My throat was too dry. The vocal cords refused to work, but I could snap my fingers. That was all I needed. She started toward me. I held my breath. There was silence all around me. As graceful as any queen, with her head held high in the air and her long red tail arched in a perfect rainbow, my little dog walked down the table. With her warm gray eyes staring straight at me, she, on she came. Walking up to me, she laid her head on my shoulder. As I put my arms around her, the crowd exploded. During the commotion, I felt hands slapping me on the back and heard the words, Congratulations, time after time. The head judge came over and made a speech. Handing me a small silver cup, he said, Congratulations, son, it was justly won. The tears came rolling. I gathered my dog up in my arms and walked to our tent. Grandpa followed, proudly carrying the cup. That evening, the head judge stepped up on the table. He had a small box in his hand. He shouted, over here, men. I have some announcements to make. We all gathered round. In a loud voice, he said, gentlemen, the contest will start tonight. I'm sure most of you men have been in these hunts before. For those of you who haven't, I'll explain the rules. Each night, five sets of dogs will be taken out to hunt. A judge will go along with each pair of hounds. Every morning, the judges will turn in that night's catch. The two hounds that tree the most coons will qualify for the championship runoff. The other four sets will be eliminated from the hunt. Of course, if there's a tie, both sets will qualify. On the following nights, only those hounds tying the first night's score or getting more will be in the runoff. Now, gentlemen, this hunt must be carried out in a sportsmanlike way. If the coon is treed where he can't be caught, such as in a bluff, it will not be counted. You must catch the coon, skin it, and turn the hide over to your judge. You are allowed to take an axe, a lantern, and a gun with birdshot, which you can use to get a coon out of the tree. Twenty-five sets of hounds have been entered in this hunt. In this box, I have twenty-five cards. Everyone in the contest will now line up for the drawing. The card you draw will tell you what night your hounds are to hunt. Walking along in the line, I noticed the beautiful red coats, the caps, the soft leather boots worn by the other hunters. I felt, a, felt out of place in my faded blue overalls, old sheepskin coat, and scuffed and worn shoes. But to the wonderful men, it made no difference. They treated me like a man and even talked to me like a man. When it came my turn to draw, my hand was shaking so hard I could hardly get it out of the box. Pulling the card out, I saw I'd drawn the fourth night. After the hunters had left, we stood around our campfire, sipping strong black coffee and listening to the baying of the hounds. Time and again, we heard the tree bark. Once two hounds came close to the camp, hot on a trail. We listened to their steady bawling. All at once, they stopped. After several minutes of waiting, a hunter said, You know what? That old coon took to the river in some way has fooled those hounds. Another one said, Yes, sir, he has. A friendly hunter looked at me and asked, Do you think he could have fooled your dogs? Thinking his question over, I said, You know? Sometimes when I'm hunting way back in the mountains or down on the river, I sing a little song I made up myself. One of the verses goes like this. You can swing, swim the river, old Mr. Ringtail, and play your tricks out one by one. It won't do any good, old Mr. Ringtail. My little Anne knows every one. The hunters roared with laughter. Some slapped me on the back. Tired and sleepy, but with a smile on my face, I went off to bed. The next morning, two blue tick hounds from the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee came out in the lead with three big coons to their credit. The other four sets were eliminated. The following morning, all five sets of dogs were eliminated. None had even tied the blue ticks, even though two had gotten two coons, and one of these had treed a third one in a bluff. That day, while eating dinner, my grandfather asked me if my dogs had ever treed three coons in one night. I said, yes, four different times, but that's all. Where do you think we should hunt on our night, Papa said. 
I told him if we could get our judge to go with us in the buggy, we would be better off if we could go far down river and get out of the range where the other dogs had hunted. He said, that's a good idea. I'll go see the judges about it. While I was washing the dishes, Grandpa said, hmm, I think I'll have a shave. I should have left the tent then, but I wasn't done with my dishwashing. With a pin, Grandpa hung a small mirror on the wall tent, tent wall. After much snorting, mumbling, and screwing of his face this way and that, the job was completed. Dabbing a little water on his iron gray hair, he reached for his brush and comb. From the corner of my eye, I watched him. I had tried to clean the beautiful brush, but hadn't been able to get all of the short red hairs from it. With two fingers, Grandpa pulled some of the hair from the bristles. Holding it in front of him, he looked it over carefully. Then bending over close to the mirror, peeking over his glasses, he inspected his head. Straightening up, he looked at the brush again. Turning around quickly, he looked straight at me and said, Say, young, not waiting for anything more, I scooted for the door. Crawling under the bunkie, I lay down between my dogs. I knew he wouldn't be mad at me, but it would be best to stay away for a little while. The third night, the blue ticks were tied by two black and tan hounds from the bayou country of Louisiana. All that day, I was restless. I prow prowled through the camp. Every little while, I would go and see how old Dan and little Ann were. Once, I took two weenies from our groceries. I heated them and gave them to my dogs for a treat. Old Dan swallowed his down in one gump, gulp and looked at me as if to say, is that all? Little Ann ate hers in a ladylike way. I could have sworn I saw a small grin on her face. Grandpa was hopping around like a grasshopper going here and there. Once, passing a tent, I heard his voice. I knew he was bragging about my dogs. I smiled to myself. Another hunter stopped me and asked, is it true that your hounds have treed six coons in one night, three up in one tree, or is that the old man just blowing off steam? I told him my grandfather had a little steam, but he was the best grandpa a boy ever had. He patted me on the head, turned, and walked away laughing. Have a wonderful night, Larson Heights, and I will see you tomorrow at school. And tomorrow night, we will continue with Chapter 16. Have a great night. Keep being responsible, respectful, and safe.